we have mentioned um, that the past two weeks, instead of reading uh, the portions from the prophets for our um, Haftarah portion that is connected thematically to the Torah portion, the rabbis have selected portions that are intended to help the Jewish people to better understand why the Lord might have allowed the destruction of the first and second temples. According to Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah 52, verse 12, the first temple was destroyed on the 10th of Av. And according to Jewish authorities, the destruction of the second temple took place on the 9th of Av which will be this Monday evening is when that day starts. It's called Tisha B'Av in the Hebrew. And it's observed today as a day of mourning for the destruction of both temples. Now, I should point out that I grew up in a fairly unobservant Jewish home. I knew what Tisha B'Av was, but I didn't know when it was because we never used a Hebrew calendar. The only days we needed to know were Passover, and that was whenever the grandparents told us they were gonna have the Passover Seder, and the High Holy Days, and that was only to take off from, make sure we took off from school on those days. So this is an event, the destruction of the second temple took place 19, almost 1950 years ago, or roughly 1950 years ago. So why is this traumatic in the life of our Jewish people today? Let's think about this. Just imagine you have this beautiful edifice, the temple, and your God, the creator of the universe, is dwelling in your midst in that temple. And you feel you're blessed beyond all other peoples in this world. You feel like in the event that your enemies attack you, you have the creator of the universe, Adonai Tzibaut, the Lord of heaven's armies to protect you. And then the next thing you know, an enemy lays siege to your city and you and your family are starving Soon afterwards, your enemy conquers your city and sends you to live in a foreign land. Don't you think you might be wondering why God has allowed this to happen? <coughs> Seventy years later, the Jewish people were able to re return to Jerusalem and rebuild a second, a second temple, <coughs> excuse me, where their God would once again dwell in their midst. That temple stood until 70 AD, when it was destroyed at the end of a four-year Jewish revolt against Rome. Don't you think that again, you might have been wondering why the Lord had allowed these events to happen? The Jewish people have concluded it was because of Sinat Hinam, Hebrew meaning baseless hatred. But the scriptures actually suggest something else. Second Chronicles 36, 21 suggests that the Lord allowed the first temple to be destroyed because the people were being disobedient. They specifically had stopped observing the rest for the land that was supposed to take place every seven years. And I would suggest that the Lord allowed the second temple to be destroyed because the ultimate sacrifice had been offered up in a heavenly tabernacle 40 years earlier. And so the earthly sacrifices were no longer meaningful. A number of calamities have occurred in the life of the Jewish people on the 9th of Av. And we have a few examples up on this slide. The destruction of the temples by the Babylonians and the Romans. The Jewish people being kicked out of England and Spain and events associated with the Holocaust. And there have been rumors in the last couple of weeks that Iran may be planning their response to Israel's execution of Ismail Haniyeh on the 9th of Av, hoping it will be just another calamity to add to the list. 
but the Lord might have other ideas. This could be a continuation of turning these days that are associated with the destruction of the temples, mentioned in Zechariah 8, verse 19, which says that one day these days of fasting and mourning will be turned into days of celebration, of feasting and joy and gladness. And this process may, may well have begun in 1948 with the reestablishment of God's people back in the land that the Lord had given to us long ago. And then we had the Six Day War of 1967 where we regained control over Jerusalem and the Temple Mount for the first time in roughly 1900 years because our God is still in the miracle working business. Amen? Yeah. How soon before the temple will be rebuilt and these days of fasting and mourning become days of celebration? We don't know when that's going to happen. But I am confident, and I believe many of you are as well, we do know that it will happen because our God is faithful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, uh, we thank you for the revelation of your word. We thank you for the blessing that it is uh, in our lives, the instructions that it contains, uh, the um, understanding of your covenant love and faithfulness. And so as we study your word tonight, Lord, I pray that it would just uh, bless us and prepare us for the challenges that we may face in the days ahead. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. My rock and my redeemer ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Time for some nourishment. Rehydration, at least. Well, I've been sharing for the last couple of weeks about the favor that we have received from our faithful miracle working God in the purchase of our new building in Greenville. Amen. Now, I talked about the favor that we received from the bank, but I made a mistake because I didn't start at the beginning. So I'm gonna do that tonight. It was actually about five years ago, and we found a local bank that was willing to loan us money so we could make an offer on an uh, old church building that was about a mile from where the new building uh, is. And about a year and a half ago, I called the bank, hoping that that same loan officer would still be there. But the loan officer I was talking to told me he was no longer there. And the first thought that went through my mind was, rut row. <laughs> this might not be good. First of all, I'm going to have to explain Messianic Judaism all over again to this new guy. And who knows, he could be anti-Semitic, just not like Jewish people for whatever reason. He could be Jewish and be very opposed to Messianic Judaism and not want to do anything to help us. Or he just might not be willing or, or able to help us. We, we heard that from some banks at that point. Turns out, he said, I was his boss. And I was aware of and approved everything that happened five years ago. So <clears throat> he was the senior loan officer at the bank, and he was willing to talk with us about our getting a loan to build a building. And this was if we found some land and we're going to build a building on it. And so the process continued. Um, <clears throat> I want us to understand that Yes, we say we serve a miracle working God, but I believe he is performing miracles to get us into that building. And that tells me that no matter what else craziness goes on in this world, that he is going to do something uh, that is going to be a tremendous blessing to the community through us. Uh, hopefully to our Jewish people and many others in the community uh, who may be able to uh, join with us in that location when they haven't been able to join with us uh, in our current location. So I'm excited about what is happening, and I am 
really hopeful that we are going to have our certificate of occupancy not in the month of Av, but in the month of August. Although I think they probably, as I think about it, they're probably pretty close, uh, closely linked this month. But anyway, real soon. And once we get the certificate of occupancy, uh, then we can move to the new building and hold services there. And so uh, I hope you're excited. I know uh, through the years, many people have laid the groundwork for this with faithful giving. Uh, and even very generous giving for those who weren't even members of the congregation. And many of you fall into that category as well and have even come out on the work days and provided some uh, elbow grease or at least some moral support uh, to our efforts. And so when we're in that new building, you're going to look around and you're going to think, yeah, I had a part in this. Uh, e even if it was only writing verses on the... Um, what are we going to call them? The, the steel framing of, of the building, the aluminum framing of the building, uh, whatever it was made out of. It was some material that you could write on. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> let's go to the Torah portions. But I, I, I am going to continue to share, and I have to tell you that when I um, have shared in the past, I think I've come up with about 50 different line items of what the Lord has done that is either tremendous favor or absolutely unbelievable and no way it happened based on uh, human efforts. And so I, I will be sharing for long after we're in the new building uh, about those events. Unless I take one whole message to do it. In that case, I could probably do it uh, in about an hour or so. But I'm planning to do about five minutes a week because, let's face it, we can't take that much blessing at one time. We, we got to spread it out. <laughs> Speaking of spreading things out, you know, the rabbis have spread out the reading of the Torah through a whole year. And last week we concluded the fourth book of the Torah, the book of Numbers, the Midbar in the Hebrew. So tonight we begin the fifth and final book of the Torah, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy come, is, is a term, comes from the Greek, deutero means second, and nomos means law or Torah. The Hebrew name of the book is Devarim, as you heard earlier, and that uh, can mean several things, including things, but uh, is often translated as words, which is how uh, Deuteronomy, the first verse in Deuteronomy uh, normally translate, it, it translates that word because Moses is um, giving words to the children of Israel as he uh, prepares to hand over the leadership reins to Yehoshua, Joshua, prior to the Israelites entering the land of promise. You'll remember the Lord told him uh, that he wasn't going to go in, but that Joshua would be, would be leading the people. The Jewish people also refer to uh, Deuteronomy as the Mishnah Torah, the repetition of the Torah, similar to what Deuteronomy uh, means in the Greek, because many of the events recounted in the book are a retelling of events and instructions found in the earlier books of the Torah. In the final portion of Numbers, Moses recounted to the Israelites all the places that they had stayed in their time in the wilderness. Remember, we talked last week about taking stock of how you had gotten to where you are. Here in the first portion of Devarim, Moses reminds the people of the mistake that caused them to spend all that time in the wilderness. In Deuteronomy 1 verse 26, Moses reminds them that their ancestors listened to the negative report of the 10 scouts. They're reminded in Deuteronomy 1 verse 35 that the Lord had said that as a result, that generation, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, will not enter the land, but will die out in an extended journey. And in our New Covenant portion, in Hebrews 3, verse 19, as we read earlier, it says that this was as a result of a lack of trust. We have to ask ourselves, are we trusting in the Lord the way that we should? Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 reminds us to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts to lean not on our own understanding, 
to acknowledge him in all of our ways, and then he will make our paths straight. He will bless us. He will provide direction. The Hebrew word for heart, anybody know? Leah is found 47 times in various forms in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, that's kind of interesting, and you'd say, wait, why didn't we talk about that in Numbers since the name of the book was Numbers? Well, the reason I mention that, that's five times more than in the first four books of the Torah combined. So it's uh, a significant aspect of the book. We uh, actually read it earlier as we do every week uh, from Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart once again uh, that, that's an important part of our relationship to the Lord he, he wants our hearts he doesn't just want simple uh, yes I'm going along and, and uh, you know just going through the motions but when he wants our hearts he wants our motivation to be to please him. He wants our motivation to be to show love towards him for the love that he has shown towards us. Twice in Deuteronomy, in chapter 10, verse 16, and chapter 31, verse 6, the Lord encourages the people to circumcise their hearts, perhaps fulfilled in the promise found in the New Covenant prophecy of Jeremiah 31, verse 32, where he says, he will write his Torah on the hearts of his people. So let's talk about, for a moment, the structure of the book of Deuteronomy. Those who came a year ago, this is just a review. But for those who have come within the past year, so that this will be new, uh, you may not realize that this whole book is written in the form of a treaty of that time called a suzerainty treaty. And in this type of treaty, a conquering king, or suzerain is another term for that, would execute this treaty to protect his rights and to establish the conditions between the conquering king and the conquered people, or vassals. And if the vassals obeyed the treaty, it contained the blessings that they would receive from the king. In the event the vassals break the treaty, the treaty outlines what curses or punishments would happen to them. And that's to be contrasted with the type of treaty that uh, the Lord had established with Abraham. That was called a covenant of strong friendship. And in this type of treaty, everything that belongs to one party is available to the other party, up to and including their most prized possession. So Genesis 22 recounts where Abraham was asked to give up his most prized possession his son Isaac, the son of promise, as a test of his faithfulness to the covenant. And we could go into more detail, but I don't have time tonight. But this type of covenant would also require the Lord to be willing then, as he tested the covenant, to have the covenant tested with him in the same way. He had to be willing to give up his most prized possession, his son Yeshua which he did roughly 2,000 years later and roughly 2,000 years ago. That was the ratification of the Abrahamic covenant. Some people believe that the Abrahamic covenant was done away with the new covenant. But what we see in that picture is that was when the Abraham covenant came into full force. So it is still in effect. And that's not a surprise to us because first of all, it's described as an everlasting covenant and second of all, Abraham had no part in the covenant. Uh, the Lord has Abraham cut some animals in half, and all that work really wears Abraham out. He is tired when he is done. And so he goes to sleep. It actually is the Hebrew word tardoma, and it really means almost coma-like. It, it, it's a deep, deep sleep. And that's when the Lord goes through between the animals, which is normally a covenant ratifying ceremony where you say, if I break the covenant, what happened to these animals should happen to me. The Lord was the only one who executed that part of the covenant. So on Abraham's part of the covenant, it's unconditional with the exception of the sign of the covenant. The Lord said, you need to circumcise your male children on the eighth day. 
Now, okay, so that's the difference between the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant. Um, we have a slide that shows the parts of the suzerainty treaty found throughout Deuteronomy. And I'm going to discuss in a little more detail the two parts that we find in this week's portion, uh, the uh, historical prologue and whatever comes after that. Uh, probably the introduction, we'll find out. The historical prologue is where the suzerain reminds the, the subjects, the vassals, of all that he has done for them. For example, Deuteronomy 1 verse 8, the Lord reminds the people of the land that he has given to them that he has blessed them with. He says he has given the land to whom? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. That's what it says, right? We got it up there for everybody to see. The land belonged to the Lord, and he decided who he wanted to give it to. And that ought to settle it, except that the adversary doesn't know how to take no for an answer. And so he continues to try and uh, remove the Jewish people from the land. He tries to convince the world that they don't deserve to have that land. They need to share it. They need to allow the people who want to wipe them out to take it over. It makes no sense, but we live in a world today that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in a lot of ways. And that's why we're glad that we're not in charge. Humans are not in charge. Some may think they are, but the reality is the creator of the universe is in charge. And so no matter what happens in the future, we can give glory to him. And we can know that he can bless in the midst of the trial. Sometimes our uh, testing and going through things that we don't like ends up doing greater things. It can lead to building up of our faith. It can lead to a re outbreak of revival. It, it can lead to many of our Jewish people seeing things in a way that they may not have seen them before. And so uh, we are praying that the Lord can take circumstances and craziness of this world that the enemy intends for evil and use it for good. He's done it before. He can do it again. The enemy thought he had a victory when he sent Yeshua to the cross. I mean, to the execution stake, he thought that was all I needed to do. And, you know, I had shown that I was more powerful than... God and that um, you know uh, the the innocent one was humiliated, accused of crimes he did not commit, and then put to death the ultimate weapon of this world, and God used that to bring reconciliation between him and us, between him and his Jewish people. You would think the enemy would have given up at that point. But as we say sometimes in the Hebrew, low, low, low. No, he hasn't. He knows he loses in the end. He's read the book of Revelation. He knows what it says. But he's trying to take as many people with him as he can. And we bring a message of uh, redemption, of hope, of encouragement. That, that you don't have to go down that road. That we can uh, help people to escape um, the death that the enemy intends for them. In Deuteronomy 1 verse 10, the Lord points out that he has multiplied the people, that they become as numerous as the stars in the sky, just as he had promised Abraham in Genesis 15 verse 5, that they would. But Moses comes to see that their increasing number means that he's going to need help in leading all of these people. He uh, assigns leaders from each of the tribes to help him and judges to help him to resolve any disputes between the people. In Deuteronomy 1 verse 16, as we read earlier, he says the judges are to judge righteously between a man, between his brother. It actually says between a man and between his brother and his sojourner is what the Hebrew says. The gay row. They all the translations um, add extra words to make it fit the terms that they use, outsider, alien, stranger. The reality is the, the um, justice that God wanted to see was within the community of Jews and Gentiles, between the Israelites 
their family members, their fellow Israelites, and the sojourners that were there in their midst. Deuteronomy 2 reminds the people of how the Lord has guided them around the lands of uh, Edom, Edom, and Moab, Moab, by giving them victories over two of the most powerful kings in those regions. In Deuteronomy 3, verses 21 and 22, uh, Moses tells Joshua, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings, referring to Sihon and Og. Adonai will do the same to all the kingdoms you are about to cross. Wow, what a blessing. What a statement from the Lord. You must not fear them. That's our natural human tendency. We see the giants. We see the downfall. I can't tell you how many times as I relay these stories about us getting into our new building, when, when that loan officer said, he's not here anymore, what was my first thought? Guess we're not going to be able to get the money to build that building. And over and over, it looked like it wouldn't go through. And over and over, the Lord did what it took. He enabled us to have the favor or the miracle uh, to be able to get there. Uh, it is my prayer that our Jewish people, who probably don't understand what is going on in the world, and many of them will not see this as something that the Lord is able to use to bless them. I pray that they would realize that the Lord their God said that he would fight for them. Amen. All they have to do is trust in him, as the vassals are going to see in this treaty that the Lord has established between himself and his people. This Shabbat, if you have a Hebrew calendar, is called Shabbat Chazon, uh, because Isaiah conveys this Chazon, this vision to the people in the Haftarah portion. In Isaiah 1 verse 4, Judah is described as a sinful nation. They have forsaken the Lord. They despise the Holy One of Israel. The Lord tells them in verses 11 and 13 that he no longer desires their sacrifices, their Shabbat, their festival observances, their assemblies, because they are meaningless to him if the people do not repent of their rebellion against his ways. As I just said, he is looking at not just the action, but the heart intent behind it. In Isaiah 1 verse 18, the Lord encourages the people to think about what they've done, even as he offers them hope, saying, come now and let us reason together. He, then he tells the people, your sins are like scarlet, but they can be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they can become like wool. This is part of the blessing of the final covenant renewal that God will make with the Jewish people. As we know from Jeremiah 31, we just talked earlier about where he says he will write his Torah on their hearts. In Jeremiah 31, verse 33, it says, through this final covenant renewal, or sometimes translated as the new covenant, I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And in this final covenant renewal, as we say every week from 1 John 1, 7, we said this earlier, the blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. That word all is pretty significant because we struggle with all sorts of sins. And some people think they've committed a sin that is so great the Lord can't forgive them. But the reality is the blood of Yeshua is more powerful than we can ever fully understand. That is the blessing that the Lord has bestowed upon us. That enables us to do what the first general of, generation of Israelites was unable to do. Because of their rebellion, we're able to enter his rest. We're able to experience the peace of God that passes all understanding. The entrance into the promised land is used symbolically to represent entering in the Lord's rest in the new covenant portion for this week that we read earlier uh, from Hebrews 3, 7 to chapter 4, verse 11. Three times in the portion it says, harden not your hearts, as we're told that this is the reason the wilderness generation did not enter into the land. They did not reach the goal. They did not enter his rest. In Hebrews 3, verse 13, believers are warned that we need to be careful that our hearts don't become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
Sin is something we all struggle with. But in most cases, it's not the sin itself. It's what we do afterwards to cover it up. We like to think to ourselves, oh, if nobody knows about it, it's like it never happened. But the creator of the universe is all knowing. So who are we fooling? The reality is we just need to say, Lord, I am sorry. I have sinned against you and against whatever situation it is. And I'm going to make it right. And I thank you that you provided your son so that I can once again be seen as righteous in your sight. How does it say we avoid having our hearts become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin? It says encouraging one another day by day. It's easy to get caught up in our own situation. The scriptures frequently see us as a community and that we're supposed to encourage and bless and take care of our fellow man our fellow community member. It's amazing what a genuine word of encouragement can do for people. I say genuine because you're really trying, bless your heart, uh, isn't nearly as good as I really appreciate that you put so much hard effort uh, into this work. We also have to be careful of backhanded compliments. Sometimes they're even said unintentionally. I've shared before, uh, you know, people come up, uh, I really enjoyed your message so much better than last week's. <laughs> My great aunt and her daughter look much younger than they were. So I kept trying to say to them, you look really good for someone your age. <laughs> I'm not sure I ever managed to get that one to come out right. Anyway, back to Isaiah, where we once again find hope for the Jewish people. In Isaiah 1 verse 21, the Lord says that the faithful city, referring to Jerusalem, and using the motif of marriage, has forsaken him and become a harlot. He says the city was once filled with justice and righteousness, but now it's filled with murderers, those who bring injustice and unrighteousness. And then in the final verse of the Haftarah portion, the final verses, Isaiah says in verses 26 and 27 in chapter 1, that Sion would someday be called the Ir HaTzedek, the righteous city. Kiryah Ne'emanah, the faithful town. Sion will be redeemed by justice and those in her who repent with righteousness. Every time we encounter the Lord's condemnation against our ancestors for their lack of trust is followed by his desire for them to return to him. Not only will our people once again dwell in the land of Israel as we are doing, not only will they once again be able to live and worship in Jerusalem as we are doing, not only will they one day rebuild the temple, but as we talked about earlier, Zechariah tells us that the days of our mourning will be turned into days of celebration. It is my prayer that our Jewish people would see these events coming to pass and say, what is the Lord revealed to us about what he is doing in our midst? And how can we be reconciled to him? May they accept his free gift of salvation through the sacrifice of his son, Messiah Yeshua. May they understand that while Israel as a whole is saved in the Lord's sight, individually they can be cut off. They can be uh, received the death pen uh, penalty. But the reality is they also can accept the sacrifice that was provided by the Jewish Messiah who came to this world for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and for all others who would call upon his name. The Lord continues to be faithful to the promises that he has made to the Jewish people. Will you trust in his promises to bring salvation, to bring Yeshua to all who would call upon his name? I'd like to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed, all you have to do, if you're ready to ask your creator to forgive you of your sins because of the shed blood of his sin, to accept his sacrifice on your behalf. All you have to do is raise your hand and you can put it right back down. You can say, I want to trust in the creator of the universe. Is there anyone? We always get that opportunity. It may be somebody watching on video. If you feel like the Lord was leading you to uh, raise your hand, uh, we'd like you to contact us by uh, email or text or even through our Facebook page. You can like us while you're there. No, just kidding. Um, <clears throat> for those of us who are already followers of Messiah, still in an attitude of prayer, perhaps you realize tonight that your heart has become hardened in some area, 
Maybe you feel like you're just going through the motions and you now realize that he wants everything you do to be meaningful, to be purposeful, to be a blessing to you. Perhaps you need to repent to make sh to shoot on uh, because you've gone away from him. But tonight you can take that first step and turn back towards him so that he might restore the relationship that he originally had with you. Are you willing to give him your heart tonight? Or maybe you're just going through a difficult time. Will you trust him to turn your times of mourning soon into times of joy and gladness? If you feel the Lord showing you to make one of these commitments or some commitment in some other area, I would just ask you to raise your hand as a sign that you've made this commitment tonight. And we're going to pray with you in agreement because none of us can do this on our own. We're a part of a community. We can bless one another. We can pray for one another. We can encourage one another. And we have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in us. And with his help, we can say to him, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, we thank you tonight for the gift of freedom that we enjoy, the blessings that you have bestowed on each one of us, on our nation, and on our people, Israel. And we ask you to soften our hearts to serve you in the way that you desire. We ask you to help us to trust you more and more in the difficult days ahead. And we pray that we would find joy and blessings, even in the challenges that we face. And Lord, we just ask you to help us to draw closer to you, to better uh, understand your love for us, and to give us opportunities to love unconditionally our spouses, our family members, our friends, so that we might better understand your unconditional love for us. Lord, we pray for a great harvest amongst the Jewish people. We pray for a great harvest in Greenville when we move there. And Lord, we thank you that you are performing the miracle for your purposes. And Lord, we just seek to be obedient to your instructions for your glory and honor. We ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. And everyone said, Amen, amen and Amen. God bless you all.